Hey everybody, today I thought would be a good opportunity to bring you guys along. I haven't really been in my fish room too much the last three weeks. Everything's been really crazy at the store, I'm trying to hire a full staff, merchandise everything. So I've been neglecting the fish room here. And by neglecting, I mean I've just been able to feed in the morning when I wake up, and then when I come home really late, I'm able to feed them again. So no breeding projects, no pulling mops, scraping algae, maintaining any plants. So I'm gonna do that all today. I do have a couple hours here. It's kind of late at night, but I do have the time. I figured it'd be a good chance to show you guys kind of what goes into the fish room. A lot of you guys are asking me to do videos showing kind of more of the maintenance. Luckily, all the tanks are on an auto water change system. So the water has been cha changing regularly. Fish aren't suffering at all. You know, we're just, um, just not being hands in the tank like I normally like every day. So let's see what we gotta do. One of the things that's definitely overdue in multiple tanks is swapping out the fry that were born in these hang on breeder boxes and a pregnant female of one of, the, one of the many guppy strains. These guys really should have been pulled two weeks ago, but you know, now they're even sexing out in here, which I've never had them in this long. I feel bad, um, but we're going to put them back in this 20 gallon. We'll get one of the females who looks closest to drop and we'll put her in there so that we can protect any newborn fry in here. These are the Japan Blue Golds. Really exploded in here. Same goes for these panda guppies. We have a ton of fry who were born in here that definitely would appreciate swimming in the main tank here. These guys are really cool. Something that I wouldn't have purchased myself. Originally, I did get them uh, from a viewer and I was really fortunate, really happy that I did because I've fallen in love with these guys. One strain that hasn't been as prolific are these Snow White Guppies. They've been dropping some fry in there. I'm pretty sure they're eating most of them that are born, but now because it's so crazy in the tank as far as movement, lots of fish, there was a little one right there that hasn't gotten eaten, which is good. But these guys, not as many in the breeder box. Even when I put them in the breeder box, if it'll focus on them, you can see them all here. Even when I put them in a breeder box, even with this much cover, females manage to eat a lot of the fry. So this is a strain that's still slowly building up the numbers. I think having a lot of fish in there helps, but I definitely want to get probably that female there and put her in the breeder box and keep an eye on her. And while we're at this tank, another thing I desperately need to do on a lot of these tanks is remove a lot of the frog bit. What I do is I use a plastic straw and I create kind of a, almost like a floating ring, a feeder ring. And usually it keeps out the frog bit. I like to have a, a space right, right in the front of the tank with no frog bit. Frog bit is one of my favorite plants. Definitely sucks up a lot of the nutrients that the, and the waste that the fish produce. The only problem is it could take over the whole tank, but it's really easy to get rid of. It's not like duckweed. Like once I remove this, this is, this is gone. So you can see how it kind of makes its way over the line here. And there are YouTube videos showing how to make these. I didn't invent these at all. Um, I saw a YouTube video on it. If you just YouTube, uh, search into YouTube, a floating ring for your aquarium, that should pop up. But there are several tanks I need to do this for just because it's been a couple weeks. Usually if you catch one piece out, it doesn't overgrow, but you could see it, it wants to make its way over. Something I don't do that often, but I definitely have to do today is siphon out all the mulm that's building up in the Pleco grow out tanks. You can see the worst offender is this tank here with the long fin bristle nose. I know it's a touchy subject for the internet. People go back and forth. I don't think it's harmful in any way to the fish. I think it's, I remove it mostly for myself. You can see that they're kind of going through there. I think it's, I actually use it for egg layers. Um, any fish that hatches out and is too small for live baby brine. This tank's actually really perfect. It looks dirty, but it's full of microorganisms. All the mulm you could see you know, they're, they're sifting through there and smaller fish will actually find microorganisms and feed on that. So I find that really beneficial. That's my opinion. You can see I have multiple tanks, not just these ones. 
uh, that have mulm built up and it gets built up behind the mat and filter. It's really easy to siphon out and we've got no problems here. You can see on the left here, there's another tank full of mulm, but Pleco grow outs doing great, not harming them in any way. This tank has my stir by Corydoras in here, the breeding group, I'm kind of just, they're kind of just hanging out right now. I'm not trying to actively breed them right now. I do scrape some algae, not as much as people think. People think I'm constantly scraping algae. I rely on plants for a lot of my filtration. So I'm not really scraping algae too much. The tanks kind of balance out just because they're so, they're seasoned at this point. The uh, water changes are happening every other day automatically. Once in a while, a tank out of balance will kind of go like, like this with diatom algae. I'll show you some tanks with some string algae, but majority of the tanks, I don't have to scrape algae at all, which is pretty great. Somewhere in this tank is a pea puffer who I need to take out some snails for me. The water looks really dirty, but it's actually really clean. It's so clean that this salvinia is actually struggling because there aren't enough nutrients in the water for it, enough nit nitrates in the water for it. I think that's the pea puffer right there. Yep, there he goes. So I'm gonna catch him and put him in another tank where I need the snails out. I just moved him to this 20 gallon here. You can see on the glass, I have Malaysian trumpet snails. And if you watch the Day in the Fish Room series, you know that I actually had left this sand out pretty much in the snow to freeze for a couple days. Then I boiled it um, because it was coming from a tank that had Malaysian trumpet snails. I did not want any snails in the tank. Uh, this tank in particular, we've got some very special fish coming and I just don't want snails in here. But somehow they survived boiling water and freezing in the gravel. You know, I, they're pretty bulletproof. It's kind of impressive, but I'm hoping that this little guy here is hungry enough and he'll, I'll go and manually start picking off the ones on the glass. Then I'm hoping that he'll go through and hunt these snails. He's kind of spoiled on bloodworms, but I'm not gonna give him any in here and he'll be forced to go and start eating some of these. There's some ram's horn snails in here too, I'm noticing. Unbelievable. It's crazy how, how much snails can endure. Here's some of the string algae I mentioned earlier, completely out of control. This typically happens in the tanks, the 10 gallons that have the light directly on them. A lot of these tanks actually have the light hung up higher, so there's not as much light going. The further that the light is from the tank, the less light. And I'm pretty sure you lose, every four inches of tank, you're losing a certain amount of light. So these guys are scorching under the sun compared to some of the other tanks. And when I don't fertilize some of the tanks, this will happen, um, but it's no big deal. It's really easy to get rid of. I just go in here and manually remove the whole thing. Yep, the big clump, I'll take the plants with it because this, this tank needs to be redone anyway. But you can keep the plants. Probably in this setup here, I'll do the same thing. Um, comes right off the plants, nice and easy. That string algae is one of the algaes that's easily removed when you just take it out of the tank. Now to prevent this from keep happening, I'd have to do some adjustments here. I'd either have to change my light or I'd have to fertilize a lot more often. I'm very lazy. I don't fertilize that often. Maybe once a week I'll go through and fer fertilize some of the tanks, not all of them. Um, sometimes it's once every other week. I haven't fertilized in three weeks and most of the tanks are doing pretty good. The fertilizer I use is Thrive. I really like it, I've been using it for years and it's something that I can actually sell in the store. So that's really good. Something like um, Easy Green, I like also. I just can't sell that in my store. So I tested Thrive for two years now and works really well. So now I'm confident I could recommend it to people. It's, you know, it, side by side comparison, they're kind of pretty much the same to me. I didn't notice one was better than the other. Something I haven't been able to do is work on any breeding projects. So something like this setup here with a pair of angelfish, 
when they when I saw that they had eggs on the slate, I just figured because I have fry already, I probably have a hundred of, of these free swimming that I'll let them go. Maybe they'll parent raise, maybe they won't. This pair in particular has usually eaten them before they're even wigglers. But as I'm checking today, they're actually at the wiggler stage. So if it'll focus here. The first couple of batches usually fung this up and then they eat them, but they're actually at the wiggler stage. So if they parent raise, I think that'd be really great. These are a really beautiful pair. One of my favorites, they're getting moved onto the new rack so I could see them front and center. Another breeding project's kind of out of control right now are these long fin bristle nose. See that male in there? Um, obviously I missed another another hatch here. I should probably take the cave out. These guys are in quarantine still. I'm waiting for them, uh, the 40 gallon that I have for them to cycle. They ended up breeding in here. You can see how many fry we have. And I'm pretty sure he's sitting on more eggs. So in their new setup, I'm gonna have to, you know, I probably shouldn't put any caves in because I don't want them breeding anymore. I've got hundreds of these guys. They're very pretty, very good looking, high quality, but um, I just don't have the time right now or the space to grow out, you know, 300 long fin bristle nose. You can see this whole row of rice fish doesn't really have any java moss in it. They have a little bit left over that's actually grown over three weeks. I pulled all the, the main mop, the eggs out so that the fry would actually hatch out. So you can see the group of oranges here. We've got the blues, the Miyukis. These are the orange lemays. Got some nice black ones there. That one's actually a nice dark body, something I'm looking for. But I'm actually gonna go through the tanks where I move the mops. The fry that actually hatched out are almost a month old now, eating live baby brine regularly. So I'm gonna take the, the java moss that's in those tanks with the fry and put them back in so that the parents can start laying eggs in there. And whenever I have more time, I can just pull the mops out, drop them in another tank, and the next morning I'll have more uh, fry being born. I do have a dedicated video on that if you wanted to know more about that. That's just a quick summary of pretty much the whole process here. Here's a tank of the orange madakas. You can see we have different stages of fry here. We have like one really big one there. Most of them are still small, but they're all taking live baby brine. I'm still putting the ceramicron in here. You can see the big clump of java moss I'm gonna take out and put back with the parents. Part of the maintenance is just observing every tank, taking a look at it, how the fish doing, how are the plants doing. Here we can see that the red root floaters are doing really well. They're kind of taking over the whole top here. I'm gonna to have to put one of those straw things there. These are the Bozeman rainbow fish, the Gary Lang strain. These will probably be on the website pretty soon. They're about almost an inch long. I sell them usually um, one inch on sex. That's how I bought them and grew them up. That was really rewarding for me. As I was admiring them, I noticed you could see how low the flow is of the, the output for the matte filter in the back. So for whatever reason, that flow has changed. So I'm actually gonna reach on back here, kind of see the setup here. I have a whole video showing the whole setup with the auto water change system and everything like that. But I'm just gonna adjust the flow here. That's a better flow. Something I'm looking for. A lot of people ask why I keep the flows so low. With the matten filters, this is very uh, directional, the flow. So if I put it really much faster than that, the fish get blown around the tank, the plants get blown around the tank. So that's a good speed for me. And you can see, there we go. These red roof floaters really growing out, growing up like a floating island here. So they're doing really well under the direct light. I'm surprised with this much light um, that the roots aren't red. You know, I'm sure if I put iron in here, uh, they would probably be more red. But really cool plant, another alternative to frog bit. Uh, something I've just been trying for the last couple months. I don't have a lot of stem plants, but I do have stem plants in this tank with the Iliodon fursidens or the trout goodyids. These are the Rotala species. I'm not sure which one exactly, but it's growing really well in this tank. You can see that the trout goodyids are finally reproducing. 
some of the fry that have been born in this tank are sexing out. But if we take a look at the Rotala, once we look at it from a different angle, you can see it's actually expanding out, covering the top here, which I think looks really cool, but I do need to trim it. And I could probably leave this for another week or two, but I know if I don't do it now, it's probably not gonna get done. And it's gonna, the problem is that it'll shade out all these bottom leaves here and these will actually die out because they're not getting enough light. Chuck Goodyids. I was, this is exactly what I wanted when I was getting them. I wanted a large group of them. I could only get, I only got two pairs at the time. That was all that was available from Greg Sage at Select Aquatics. But they're very fast moving fish. They're kind of, they remind me of the movement kind of looks like, uh, reminds me of cichlids, but they're a live bearer. I know a lot of you guys have been asking about these. When am I gonna put them on the website? I'm gonna wait till I have a few more. Um, once the fry I have in here grow up, I get some females dropping. Problem is these guys don't reproduce very fast. They have very few fry at a time. And I don't think they do so well in shipping. So they'd have to be an express only shipping. And I have to figure out some way on the website to kind of block the ability to buy these with priority mail shipping. I hope that kind of maintenance mode behind the scenes video was interesting to you guys. Thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.